Welcome, everyone. This is episode 21 of the Brandon Adams podcast. I have with me Ben Salsky, otherwise known in the poker world as Sauce123. Now, the term best poker player in the world is is thrown about, um, but I would wager that whoever set the poll, if we had a consensus best poker player in the world, uh, Ben Salsky would get by far the most votes, especially if you poll the top 20 or top 50 players in the world. It's very likely that that Ben uh, comes on top. Now, he will he will dispute this, but um, <clears throat> I think he is the consensus best thinker and player in the game. So, Ben, welcome. Glad to be here, Brandon. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Let me dispute. Uh, you know, I think there, I'm among them, which is plenty good enough to go on a podcast and talk about poker. But uh, I, I don't think there is a, a, a clear best um, cause there's so many different variations of poker. People have different skills. Um, but you know, there's like 20 or 30 players who I think are really excellent. And, and I think that I'm among them, which is fun. So your last podcast, I listened to it, I believe in its entirety. It was three and a half hours with Joe Ingram. It was around three years ago and you recorded it while you were walking on your treadmill desk. That's all true. You're very brave. Do you still own a treadmill desk? I do. It's at my, um, normally I work in an office uh, that I share uh, with some other players and it's there. Uh, although during lockdown time, I've been working from home. I have a treadmill desk. I do not wow. use it. I, I used it for one week and then decided I much preferred sitting down and getting my exercise other ways. I get that. I do a lot of that, but at the time I'd be playing poker for like 12 plus hours at a stretch sometimes. And it was just like, you know, it feels like your body is like decaying when you're just sitting there for 12 hours straight, like totally immobile. So, um, yeah, straight out of quarantine, I picked up a hamstring in this injury, relatively minor, but I, I believe it came from just sitting all the time. Yeah. So, Okay, this is a rare podcast opportunity. Viewers should know that you and I have logged um, medium double digit hours on Skype in the past, where at one point we were trading poker lessons for economics lessons. So right. before the, before the uh, pod, we decided that uh, we, would, we would maintain this structure. We would have half poker, half economics. And we will just see how long the poker takes us and do an equal measure in economics. I've been flattered that you have uh, you have listened to the pod and you've enjoyed the the economics guests. I'll quiz later as to who who your favorites were. But with poker, I will I will divvy up my time half uh, half questions of interest to the general public and half questions of interest to me. Okay. Um, so I think. When you're talking with the best in the game, I do think people like to to learn uh, details about daily routine. So you mentioned your office. You share it with a few poker players. Uh, you guys are just like in your little cubbies waiting for games and then and then playing playing poker. Or do you guys is poker just part of it? And you guys are chatting stocks and life and books and everything else. How does it go? It's very different, actually. So uh, my house is what is be so. First of all, um, around UIGA, when a bunch of people, um, you know, fled from the U.S. Um, originally, this house was occupied by uh, Dan Smith and Donnie Stern and people like that. And this was quite a bit before my time. And over over time, there's been like waves and waves and waves of poker players who have inhabited this house, and I'm the only poker player left standing. So basically, no one there even plays poker anymore. Although um, quite recently, um, uh, Luke Greenwood moved in, and he's still playing quite a lot of poker. And I'm actually not playing nearly as much poker as I used to. But um, for most of my time there, I just sit around and talk about basketball with Aaron Jones, and uh, you know, hang out, which is which is nice. Nice. And your wife or serious girlfriend, wife? Wife, yeah. Wife. That probably wasn't, you know, I guess 
I wish we were married in the Joey pod, but I might not have been uh, broadcasting that fact. I don't know. So she's like survived this rotating cast of poker players and she's still, oh, she does she's not still live there. No, that's uh, where I go. That's the office. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but she, this crew probably social life as well. You guys are going out a decent bit. Yeah. Hang out with them, hang out with um, friends of ours from non poker as well. Your poker routine. Now you mentioned to me that you you really focus on the games that you find most enjoyable. Is that, is that uh, like learning? You want to learn mixed games or the uh, table composition or what? What does your day-to-day poker look like? Are you still sitting lobbies? Is that a, is that a thing? I've been playing a lot of mixed games now for like four years, maybe even more. So, um, so I, I, that's, I play a lot of PLO still and I play a lot of mixed games. I actually don't play very much in them and hold them anymore. Um, and you can sit lobbies. It's just sort of unsatisfying because um, you sit lobbies for a while. You're only like, yeah, I mean, it, it's very grindy. I've become sort of a uh, like more recreational in my approach over time <laughs> because uh, I don't find it very enjoyable to go and wait half the day to bum hunt some poor player along with five other pros and one table and sort of know exactly how to play every hand. And it feels very much like a job at that point to me. Um, so what I try to do is play sporadically, but try to play in games where I can get into, uh, you know, more of a flow state where I'm playing a lot of different tables at once, where I'm playing against another good player or something that I find is, um, very satisfying for me as a competitor um, while still being quite profitable, you know, uh, typically yeah, I can't just go around all day playing the top few players in the world because uh, the variance is too large. You say that there are, there are some games where you're confident that you're making the right decision the vast majority of the time, or you're, you're confident that your strategic hole is, is as solid as, as it's going to be in your operating in that way like it's what? not that it, it's just that it's kind of boring like you're sitting there and you, you're sitting on stars right so this is what it actually looks like on a moment-to-moment basis so you're on poker stars and you're one of the better players and say you can hold a lobby so you go and you sit your 50 100 no limit hold them lobby on poker stars and you might have to wait there for four or five six hours and then there's a handful of weaker players recreational players who like to play that game so you sort of so first of all, depending on how predatory you want to be you might like set your rhythms to theirs you might say oh they like to get up at eight o'clock in the evening. So you say, you know, I won't be home for dinner because I need to go hunt this poor, you know, guy or whatever. I don't really like doing that anymore. Uh, and then you do that and you, you play and then the table gets populated with a bunch of other good players and the recreational player might be losing at a, a loss rate of like, you know, 30 big blinds per hundred. And the regular who's most skilled at the table might be getting, uh, you know, seven or eight or more big blinds per hundred of that. But if you're a pretty good player, that guy's just losing so much compared to where your skill level is, even if you're not way up here, that you're still going to be winning four or five big blinds per hundred, which in this case is four or $500 an hour or more, which is, which is pretty, pretty good for one table in poker. Now, that being said, you're not really, you are competing. You are making some interesting strategic decisions at various times, but you're kind of just like one tabling and like maneuvering around this weaker player and, and doing the different things. And it's not like, there's a lot of downtime. Uh, so, so for me, I would much rather um, be playing a heads up mix game or something against a player who I might not have a huge edge over, but who, where I'm constantly making interesting decisions. Uh, for me, that feels a lot more fun, a lot less like work. Now a 30 big blind per hundred player in the, in the old days, that would be like a, like a really, really bad player. Is that still like a really, really bad player or the, the sharper players are just uh, better at, at capitalizing on, on weak play? Is that, that's still like a, like a terrible, terrible poker player, right? No, I don't think so. Um, the regulars are really good now. Uh, and the best ones in particular are really good. And so, you know, actually a good game to, to talk about this analogy with is like Limit Hold'em, because in Limit Hold'em, you can be a superstar Limit Hold'em player still. It's not, it's not like rote, it's not easy. But that being said, if you get to like, 
if you start playing reasonable pre-flop and you you have a reasonable idea of like the fundamental mechanics of limit hold'em, you might get to like 85% of the win rate of the guy who studied 10x more than you. There's like very uh, diminishing marginal returns to knowing more about limit hold'em beyond the the major basics. Uh, and so that's sort of the phenomenon, no limit increasingly. So, you know, you're the player, the recreational player goes and they don't know any of that. And so they, they get really crushed. And then, you know, maybe 85 or 80 or 75% of it or whatever. And you just win, you win heaps from them while still losing a fair bit to the players who are actually much more skilled than you. But they, they can't extract that much value because you know enough. And is that um, just due to like starting how hand foundations could get you pretty far in limit hold them, but not will not serve you very well in big bet or yeah i mean so pre-flop is extraordinarily important in both but in limit hold them it's like you know if the bot starts and it's six small bets like the only huge mistake you can make is folding so like <laughs> uh, it's if you're getting pre-flop relatively close it's hard to to be a big loser in limit hold them if that rec player who's sitting with the <clears throat> with the best big bet players in the world let's just call it no limit hold them for now Sure. If he um, if he's losing thirty big blinds per hundred hands, but he's not terrible at poker, how how many big blinds per hundred was he losing? Say, like eight years ago. Well, less. But I mean, everyone's everyone's play has gotten so much better in eight years. So I mean, players that week just basically don't play online poker anymore, particularly no limit hold them because it's just not fun. I mean, you just never win. I mean, even if you're a recreational player, you want to like win sometimes and have some kind of thrill of competition and feel like you're occasionally making the right decision in hands. Um, the edges in no limit hold them are really punishing for for um, people who haven't put a fair bit of time in at this point. What is the state of the best AI bots? I assume that like an AI no limit bot is beating you or... Are they not beating you? What is, what, is the, what is the state of AI versus best humans right now? I just want to add a little bit of precision to the question. So we can imagine, well, okay, well, let's, let's start here. So first of all, the things that the AIs are playing typically, or the AIs that you see published in academic journals is not full-scale no limit hold'em. It's typically no limit hold'em where the stack size is reset every hand, which is close enough, but it's not actually full skill, uh, no limit hold'em. Um, and then, of course, the way the AIs work is that within their abstraction, so an abstraction is the set of bet sizes that their solution is solved to a given level of error for. So just to make that a little more clear, we can imagine an AI that is allowed to make it two and a half big blinds preflop, but it's not allowed to make it 2.6 or 2.7 or 2.8 or 2.4. It's just they someone builds a game tree into the AI and they say two and a half big blinds is the size you get to raise. And then they solve for that. So within that abstraction, the, the developer um, of the AI will know that the AI is only exploitable for a certain amount. It'll know how close to optimal it is within this constrained set of options baked into the AI, which you can call the AI's abstraction. Now, AI developers will want to make their AIs more flexible because what they're concerned to do is publish in academic journals and, and also just to have the satisfaction of being able to create a, a program that can respond to all the different bet sizes you see in Null Limit Hold'em. So what they'll do is they'll build algorithms to tweak the AI outputs to anything they encounter in the wild, and this will ad introduce additional error and exploitability into the AI. So for example, I'm just going to give an example of one way they've done this because the details matter. So say that your AI has a 2x and a 3x raise in its preflop tree, and it runs into a 2.5x at the table. It'll have some way of like taking kind of some kind of average of the ranges it uses to play against the 3x and the 2x, and that's what it'll play against the 2.5x. But that's not actually hard solve. It's just kind of a heuristic that's baked on top of a hard solve that lets you respond to this bet size you see in the wild. So if I'm a decently good player and I sort of know the AI's weaknesses and I know how it was developed and crap like that, I can conceivably pick some bet sizes and some weird lines and stuff that are kind of outside of its abstraction and that are good optimally as well that will allow the AI to make errors. And 
the fact is is that with with the the limitations on computing power that we still have and the set of algorithms that people are using to solve poker games um no one has an ai that's even close to perfect at this point the game is still too big and too complicated particularly six-handed although the heads up ais are nasty so i mean there's definitely heads up ais that would wipe the floor with me um there are six-handed ais that are probably not very far away that would also wipe the floor with me but right now it's probably competitive three-handed or larger particularly with deeper stacks and things like that uh in no limit hold them that's my answer. It begs the question, um, to what extent is online poker currently safe from AI technology? There was, there was a video that I saw circulating on, on Twitter that, that showed uh, someone playing with what appeared to be like active, like an active AI assistant, and it seems it seemed pretty interesting and people on Twitter were suggesting that this is why online poker is, has kind of a tough future. And I, maybe you could also expand into what you see as the, as the future of online poker, because, and as an observer that is not playing, I have noticed that you've, you've seemingly gone from an environment where you had flawed but decent policing from the sites um, to an environment that looks a little bit wild west and is um, maybe uh, less safe and less professionalized for the vast majority of the online player pool than ever before. I, I don't, I don't know. Cause I'm not playing, I'm just observing, but it just looks, it looks like online poker is in, uh, an unhealthy state generally and an unhealthy state with regard to policing itself from things like AI. Yeah, this is a big question. So I'm going to probably go on for a long time. So like, I'm going to separate this into like three sub answers. So first of all, is what's possible in principle right now. So how could people be cheating? The second thing I'm going to talk about is practice, which is how people are in fact cheating right now <laughs> and what they're likely to, how they're likely to cheat in the future. Cause I run into them in the wild. I mean, I get cheated routinely in poker games, right? So I'm fairly skilled at figuring this out. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is policing, which is um, how sites can push back on cheating. Um, and what, what I think they're doing now. And I've had a little experience working with sites in various capacities. So I have a bit of inside knowledge into this. Okay. So what's possible in principle. So, um, so right now cyborgs are still stronger than, than, um, than bots. So, um, a relatively skilled human player working with some kind of real time assisted software is going to be significantly stronger than the software alone because the software is kind of bad at guesswork. So again, just going back to the previous example I used, well, we have the outputs for how to play against the three X rays and we have the two X rays, but that two and a half X, we're not really sure about that. Well, humans can like, if they have a, you know, if they have something on their screen saying, this is how you play against three X and this is how you play against two X and they see the two and a half X, they're usually better than the, than the machine at, at, at guessing about that in the meantime. And that's even more true when you get in these weird spots on the river that are far more complex and require much more sophisticated guesswork. So man-machine combos are the gold standard of online poker right now. And the type of man-machine combos are what are called um, real-time assistance. So you have some bot that is following the action on the table. So it sees that you're playing six max no limit. It sees that the button raised X big blinds. It sees the big blind three bet to Y big blinds. It sees the flop. It sees the action and the bet sizes in terms of pot. And every time it does that, it's popping up matrices of ranges that are how the bot thinks each player should be playing at each one of these game nodes. And it's popping those up for the player at all times. And then the player's just sitting there kind of tweaking those and knowing the little flaws in the bots' reasoning and knowing how this particular opponent plays and doing some exploiting of, of their own. And then the combination of the bot and the person can play even better than the bot could alone and really ruthlessly exploit someone. Also, these... these um, 
real-time assisted players can do some smart stuff because in the process of their exploiting of other players, they sort of cover their tracks because they don't always play perfect because they're trying to exploit flaws in other humans' play, so they don't always emulate the bot. And they can even systematically deviate from optimal play in order to throw off the sites from catching them, which is another problem. So in theory, it's possible to cheat the hell out of online poker. I mean, you can really cheat right now. Um, and the reason I say this, so I, I have actually not been approached to cheat, I think because of my reputation in poker um, and the fact that I would be like, quite likely to out someone. Um, but I know many players who I'm close with who have been um, approached by a variety of professional cheating teams. And what they do, they have a business model. The business model makes sense. They create a real-time assistance software to, to, of the kind I just described. They sell it to successful professional players. They don't have to be that successful. They just have to be decent. And then in exchange for a percentage of the profits, they license the software to the professionals and then go ahead and cheat with it. So that's really bad. <laughs> Okay, so that's what's, that's what's possible in principle, and it is happening sometimes. Now I'm going to switch to practice. What is actually happening in online poker? I think a lot less of this cheating is happening than it seems like there should be from, from the analysis of incentives and practicality that I just gave of the in-principle thing. It's really easy to cheat, and it's really profitable to cheat, and I think you're really unlikely to get caught. And yet, I actually don't think very many people are cheating, which is kind of cool. Uh, humans are a little bit better than I had feared about this. Um, when I play in the high stakes, no limit games on Poker Stars, which are the games which are most likely to be cheated, probably, um, because the money is so large and, and um, enforcement is so difficult. I watch the way these guys play and I see them making systematic mistakes that are both not exploitive and that basically make no sense. They generally play well. They appear to be thinking um, about decisions as they happen. And I don't see very much evidence for players using this kind of software in those games. Now, I'm sure there are some who are doing a great job covering their tracks and are cheating. But I think if you're... I think people are mostly resisting this temptation, which is, which is kind of amazing. Uh, and not something I would have expected, but I just see the players making mistakes in real time, and I conclude that they're not cheating because it's like it's not like you want to just like torch eight hundred like eight big blinds and expected value on fire just to prove that you're not cheating. And also, I, I'm going to also um some of the plays that cheaters would make are these things that add almost no expected value to the game tree, but are extremely complicated to execute, and so there, that can be an easy way to spot cheaters. So. For example, maybe it's some very esoteric spot where you like check call the turn and then optimally you're supposed to lead the river 2% of the time for a very specific bet size with some very specific range in this spot that just never comes up. And it's a situation where you're, if you're an interested human, you could study your whole life, uh, you could study poker your whole life and you would never come upon this situation to study because it's too esoteric and it doesn't do anything doesn't add any value to your strategy. It's just this weird sort of artifact. And sometimes you see the, if you're, if you're playing against a bot, you'll see them make plays like this because the bot doesn't know that it would give them away. It's just a bot. Um, <laughs> but um, I don't see humans making plays like this very often, which, which kind of makes me think that they're not robots either. Um, so I think in practice, there's actually not that much cheating, at least on poker stars. I don't, I don't want to interrupt, but one... Um... I think what was circulating on Twitter was one of these teams that had made a, a video of their assistant in action, and they were basically trying to uh, to sell it and make it more widespread, and they were seemingly targeting lower buy-in kind of players. Um, so maybe there's reason to worry about the future. I don't know. I, I actually didn't follow the Twitter thread so closely. I just watched the video and it seemed superficially impressive. And um, some commentators like Matt Berkey said, this is, this is a reason to be very concerned about the future. There's tremendous reason to worry. I've been super worried about this for like six years. Uh, it's because there's huge incentive to do it and enforcement's very difficult. So I just want to talk a little bit about enforcement, which is that um, 
there's basically two ways to enforce this stuff. The first is like kind of like forensic evidence. Like you look at how accounts get funded. You look at patterns of transfers between accounts. You look at time zones where they play. Um, they do weird stuff. Like they, um, there's tests you can do where you like try to see if a human is actually clicking the buttons by like introducing weird like pixels onto the screen and shit like that that tends to screw up the bots. So these, um, that's kind of like a more like almost police work or forensic way of ferreting out these cheaters. Um, and then the other way to do it is to do more of like a quantitative analysis. So you might like have a model of a given spot of what optimal play is that um, say, say looking at an AI and you might look at um, deviations from optimal play that are made by players. And you might find people who are just playing a little bit too perfect. And you might say, and that, that's more than what's humanly possible. And that's something that I've run into. So occasionally I'll be playing heads up against someone and I'll be fairly confident they're a robot. And it's because they just literally never make a mistake. And as someone who's dedicated the majority of my adult life to mastering poker at this point and have shown aptitude for it, I have a pretty strong idea of what is humanly possible and what isn't. And I can figure it out when someone is playing impossibly well. Makes sense. And and where are those mistakes uh, most likely to manifest themselves like on the on like turn and river play or where is the AI's very good play, perfect play really showing itself? Presumably it's not pre-flop really. It's just or is there is there no answer to that? Is it all about the integration of the of this strategy? No, no, there's an answer to it. I mean it depends on the game, but mostly it's in spots that are, um, so there's, there's a concept. Um, basically, there's situations that are both very, very low frequency, require a, a unique concept to learn and execute and add very little expected value to your game tree. And these are the ones that give away your cheaters. So if you're a human, because poker is so vast and there's so much to study, you don't work on the stuff that is really complicated, doesn't generalize, and doesn't add any value to your play, right? That would be, that would be crazy. So uh, you ignore that stuff and you look for things that, you look for the low-hanging fruit of studying. So you pick out your cheater by finding someone who routinely is making these impossible plays that are not the low-hanging fruit. They're these things that only the platonic ideal of a poker player or a robot would find. So it's a situation where I, I talked about the same spot, and I'm not going to flesh it out with an example because they're hard. But like, let's say that you check call the turn in a three-bet pot and the river brings a flush and a straight, and you are supposed to lead the river 5% of the time for all in and mostly you're supposed to check. These are situations that actually come up. And the reason why this works in game theory is that if you always check that river, then um, your opponent would, like your, um, if you always check that river, then you wouldn't get quite enough value because your opponent would be able to check behind too many marginal strength hands. But because it's only 5% of the time, it adds such a tiny fraction of expected value to that node of the game tree. And it just comes up so rarely that it might increase your expectation in the pot, like on average by a tiny, tiny fraction of 1%. But to find the hand that actually makes that lead would, re would require, require tens of hours of study. So you get these situations where from a human psychology perspective, in order to find this tiny esoteric play that adds no value, someone would have had to commit tens or hundreds of hours of study. But it would be literally crazy to commit that much study to find that play because it's adding cents per trial to something that never comes up, <laughs> you know? Sure. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Talk about the, the environment of online poker more broadly outside of the cheating possibilities. Um, I've noticed that there seems to be, well, say there are new players like GG Poker that seem to be rising and they seem to have a um, almost a different philosophy of the game, like less professionalized and more uh, rec oriented and 
I, I haven't looked carefully, but I've heard that the rake structure is like a very high rake structure, sort of not appealing to pros, unbeatable by pros, but but it seems like some games go. Um, so they must be doing something that that uh, is appealing to to recreational poker players in general. Like, how do you see the overall landscape uh, changing? Yeah, tough question. Well, it's a big, it's a big landscape, first of all. So, um, so there are still the established players like the poker stars and the party poker, although poker stars now being publicly traded and, and making more of its earnings from various casino games and from sports betting isn't really focusing on poker anymore in the same way that it did. Uh, there, there does seem to be a bit of a push from all the poker sites to sort of build a, like build a better mousetrap. Like, you know, previously the pros were getting say 50% or more of the recreational players losses. And the pros were adding liquidity to the, to the site. Whereas now I think the sites have realized that with a dwindling number of recreational players, what they're trying to do is create games where the pros are getting much, much less than 50 or 60%. The pros are getting, you know, five, 10% and the site's keeping something like 90%. And they're doing this by, by jacking these, the rake sky high and then trying to sell that to, to the recreational players. Um, and I think time, there's also been a much more um, play on various private games, like various apps and things like that, that are, um, generally hand-picked player pools um, where the experience of the recreational players and the integrity of the game and the lack of cheating can be guaranteed by someone who's overseeing the game and knows the players. Um, so there's been quite a lot of that as well. Yeah. What you mentioned with poker stars, I think um, is maybe a big concern for the gambling industry generally that, um, that poker stars is making a lot of money from online casino and uh, I understand that the fantasy companies are also making a lot of money from online casino and that uh, generally isn't how people think about their business. And it may be that they're making money from problem gamblers uh, gambling on the browser or, and, the, and the cell phone and that's not it's not ideal. We, we wouldn't necessarily want the, a world where the best poker operator is, is making most of their money that way. And the best fantasy operators are making a lot of money that way. It's uh, it's not an ideal way for things to go. Yeah, I agree. I mean, my somewhat rosy view is that there will be poor second order effects to like optimizing your business to prey on these um, problem gamblers and people who just want to do online casino gaming. Um, so like, again, my kind of idealistic view is that poker kind of has value as a game. It's something that I've spent, you know, a tremendous amount of my life doing and perfecting. And it's because I really, I mean, I really like it. I think it's really fun. It's a great way to use my brain. It makes me feel good. I like the rush of competition. I like to, I like to bluff. I like to lock wits with people. I like the depth of the game. These are all things that I like about poker. And for me, these sort of aesthetic pleasures of poker are shared by both pros and and recreational players alike. Now the pros may have decided that they need to make sure that they're making money almost every time they play because there's so much luck in the game and they need to pay bills. They've decided to professionalize it to some degree, but hopefully the pros are still deriving the same sort of enjoyment from the game as the amateurs are. And the amateurs do fairly frequently outplay the pros. Poker is not entirely mechanical. And as an amateur player, you can do some studying and play well and you can beat a bunch of different pros. Uh, and I think that's exciting as well. Um, and my thinking is that, sure, when you have a bunch of liquidity on your site because people are excited to come play this great game, maybe you can optimize your short or medium term profit, profits by steering people's attention into these random clicky side games that you can entrap them into. But my feeling is that if they start uh, jeopardizing the integrity of the actual good game that gets people excited to go on the site and spend a ton of time playing poker, eventually their bullshit casino game business will evaporate and people will go elsewhere to play to play the real game. Um, so I have a commitment 
with Galfont where we're going to play uh, around 1,200 hands, and he's laying me 1.5 to 1, which is not very big price. And the, the price came about because originally we were going to do the same amount of time online, but it required me to go to Canada, and I didn't want to... I looked at the logistics, and I was like, hey, let's just play in Vegas. And he's like, well, if we're going to do that, it has to be lower. And I said, all right, fine. So anyway, um, the price isn't as good as it might be, but I'm studying up for 1200 hands of 100, 200, um, hundred big blinds deep. And I'm training using Phil's site as of now. I've been watching his videos and using his uh, vision trainer, which is okay so far. It's not, it's not great. I don't know if you've messed with it, but it's his like AI uh, teaching aid for heads up PLO. Um, I need the, I need the sauce learning plan for 100 big blinds against Phil. I do feel like I have some level of advantage because, um, I enjoy, for instance, watching the Twitch videos where he plays Perkins and getting to see his whole cards and, um, listening to his reasoning for how he's playing against Bill and watching, watching Bill's uh, changing strategies against against Phil. It's um, <clears throat> it's it's been an enjoyable process preparing, and I'm I I think it will be fun if whatever there's another few months of preparation. I'm wondering what the sauce game plan is. What I'm tempted to do first is ruthlessly handicap your expected value. Do you want to do that? Yes. <laughs> okay. So you're going to play 1,200 hands. Is that correct? Approximately 1,200 hands, yeah. And what is the size of the side bet? 150 to 100K. 150K to 100K. Okay, that's really good for you. You want a huge side bet here because my suspicion is the side bet is plus EV for you while the play is strongly negative EV for you. But it depends on the relative sizes of each. You also have you also have the quit option, by the way. Like you don't have to play the twelve hundred hands. Like I can I can have a terrible first day and like quit. Yeah. So so there's a website called primedope.com that should okay. probably be your best your best friend. Uh, it has a poker variance calculator. So you're gonna have all of these um, utility based things that happen. So like, what I'm just gonna do is I'm gonna take some. I'll take a pessimistic expectation of your win rate and i'll say that you're losing to fill at 10 big blinds per hundred and then i'm going to guess that the standard deviation is 175 and you're playing 1200 hands if that's the case it means that you will win the match 42 around 42 percent of the time which as you can see is good for you because you're being laid odds in the side bet and additionally you're going to lose on average um 10 times 200, so 2,000 times uh, 12 intervals. So your expectation in the match is going to be negative 24K. And then, then I would just kind of sum these together. So I would say, okay, so Brandon ZV uh, in play is negative uh, 24K. And then I would say Brandon's uh, EV in side bet is um, negative... 100k times whatever it is 57 58 percent of the time and then um plus 150 um 42 percent of the time and then you just set those equal and you figure out your ev for the match but it, it's going to be more complicated than that because you're actually going to be giving up and it's it's a lot of it's going to be about utility in a match this short so your primary goal actually isn't to get better at PLO. It's to get better at winning the side bet, the highest frequency you possibly can. <laughs> well, so, so with regard to th that, um, it's actually the stipulation we have is that the stacks reset each day. We're playing approximately like six to eight hours a day for five, five days. Um, oh, it's going to be live, right? Yeah. And it resets to 20 each day. And then it's also like 20 min. So it gets deeper as the day goes on. So there seems to be a lot of value to strategies like, like bloating the pot in certain situations where it's not entirely called for. And then, and then the match comes down to 
a few big pots basically or or like as an extreme version in the first day when the stacks are deep late in the day you you take a couple of close decisions like say say call the three bet is a bit better pre-flop but like you elect to blow up the pot pre-flop and and have those pots weigh heavily in the outcome Okay, so this is how you do it. So in um, in PLO, standard deviations of individual pots vary pretty much linearly with the size of the preflop pot. Not quite, but it's a pretty good simplification. So basically what you want to do is you want to, suppose that optimally you think you're supposed to three bet some amount and you think you're supposed to raise first in some amount. Say it's like 85% and 20%. That's not quite right, but close enough. When you're behind, what you're going to want to do is is increase both of those. So instead of raising 85% on the button, you probably want to raise like 88%, not too much more. But how you really smash the variance is you three bet and four bet more. So instead of three betting your 20%, you three bet like 25, 30%. And then that that is going to increase your standard deviation a bunch, which is good for you and behind. And similarly in four bet pot, there's a bunch of kind of marginal four betting hands. You're supposed to four bet and heads at PLO, whatever it is, between five and 8% or something like that. Well, it's pretty easy to four bet 10%. It's not that costly in expectation. And it's going to make a bunch of giant pots that can make you come back. Uh, so that's what you want to do. And then conversely, when you're ahead, you want to do the opposite of that. So instead of raising on the button, you want to do a lot of limping and still some raising, but you want to do quite like I'd play something like, you know, um, it depends on how extreme the effect is, but you want to introduce some limping because it's not costly to limp on the button and heads up PLO. It's like a fine play, but it's just um, a little bit more complicated than raising, but it reduces your variance a lot. So you probably want to do a lot of limping when ahead. And you also want to do less three betting, less four betting, a little bit more folding, but not that much, but mostly just more flat calling. And then in-game strategy, I guess, is kind of important as well. I Obviously, the uh, the first match that Phil played against VD or whatever, um, the in-game got quite intricate because it really did come down to the last few hands. But yeah. um the consensus, and I don't remember their side bet exactly, but I guess for their side bet, which was relatively large, and for my side bet that is pretty large relative to the 100, 200, you, um, when you're near the end and you can lock it up, you tend to do that strongly. Um, and before that part where you can lock it up, you, um, you go to lower variant strategies as you mentioned, but um, I'll have to do some work to determine where exactly your your cutoff point for locking it down is. Um, I would I, yeah. like clearly if you could burn, I don't know, fifteen k and lock it up. I guess you would you would do it. Um, and I don't know at what point. It it would be interesting to just look at at what point he's supposed to lock down and at what point I'm supposed to lock down. And it's probably it's probably easiest to do it just in terms of a cutoff point. Well, well where you can just fold your way to assure the win. I talked about this a little bit with some other players and I I think I think once you can just lock up the side bet, you just basically do it. And that's true for him yeah, I mean, I mean, there are there are different cases too. I mean, you could, in theory, like win an enormous pot that happened to be two thousand big blinds for some crazy reason, and then you had way more than enough to fold to the win. And so, in, at that point, you're going to play much tighter than normal, but you're still going to play a bunch of hands. Like it would be, you know, you're not going to fold ace ace king king double suited when you can still lose an all in pot and then fold your way to the win. That would be insane. So, I mean, there's those cases, but those don't really come up. So, actually, when you can fold, once you can fold your way to the win, you're probably just going to do it. Now, um, with regard to blowing up variants, the um, the play that I'm most comfortable with, obviously, is later in a day when stacks are deep, increasing the, the four betting on the button. So going from, as you say, like 6% to 9% or whatever it is, um, because there i'm first of all taking phil a little bit out of his comfort zone out of his solved regions of the game if you will because the stack depths will be deeper than 
his experience base, not his experience base, but he it's it's outside of his solved domain or outside of his automatic domain. He's having to play it on the fly. Um, and it's clearly just increasing the variance hugely. And a lot of it's just coming down to cards playing themselves. Um, so that part I'm, I'm very comfortable with increasing for betting frequencies, especially later in the day. Um, the part about increasing three bet frequencies pre-flop um to me that seems like harder to execute for me from an ev standpoint i mean clearly it's blowing up variants but for me to blow up pots more than optimally out of position against phil seems questionable hard to execute yeah. from an ev standpoint Definitely, and there's going to be a pretty significant cost and expectation as well there, obviously, right? Which which matters. And actually, I was thinking, I was thinking that um, I was considering strategies where you went the opposite way because of the because of the side bet. You could you could consider a strategy where, let's say your your four betting range was higher than optimal pre flop. So you're playing like very aggressively from the button and willing to play huge pots from the button, okay? And then and then from out of position, you're much more solid and you're making your ranges more defensible all around. So like I'd be spots where I might be inclined to check raise on the flop, I'm tending more to call just to keep the overall range stronger and to keep like the, the, to maximize my chance of realizing equities from the big blinds while knowing that I'm losing some EV, um, keeping the variance relatively small out of position and saving, saving variance for, for the button. In other words, playing a bit tighter than optimally out of position and a bit looser than optimally in position. Yeah, I don't, what I would tend to do is when behind, I would just like for any given node of the game tree. So I'll just make up a node just to give a concrete example. So you raise to three X on the button, Phil calls, the flop comes down. Well, let's do an out of position example. That'll be better. So Phil raises three X in the button. You call from the big blind. The flop comes down, ace, jack, seven, two spades in the diamond, and you check, and Phil bets three-quarter pot. That's a node. Now you have to respond. Your, your options are fold, call, and check raise or something. So if you have some kind of prior of what sort of action frequencies you want to take at that node, um, what I would tend to do when behind is increase the frequency of the most aggressive one by some fixed constant to the best of my ability. So in this case, it's the check raise. Your, your standard deviation doesn't increase that much by calling. You probably want to, I mean, it does. So you probably want to call just a touch more than you would normally. But mostly what you want to do is check raise some of your calls. So say you're supposed to check raise, you know, 12% at that situation. Maybe I say that I want to raise it by 10%. So instead of 12%, I try to check raise 13.2%. So I just say, okay, 10% of my 12% check raise frequency is 1.2%. I just add that to my frequency. So I just take some of my calls and I throw them into my check raising range and then just try to watch all hell break loose because that's what I want to happen. Um, and then you want to select these additional check raises or, or whatever the, the additional aggression hands are um, by the ones that you think have the lowest um, expected value delta difference between call and check raise. So again, on the same board, let's say it's H jack seven with a flush draw. Say you get in a spot where you have ace jack five, four with a backdoor flush draw and you see the 75% pot C bet and you're like, well, you know, I'd usually just check call here with it with kind of a dryish top two hand, but you know what? I want to pump up the variance. <laughs> so instead you just check raise that hand and then figure it out. Yeah, uh, that's the sort of thing I would be doing. So whatever my aggression frequency, this could be pre-flop. If I, if I want to raise the button 85%, I just say, say I want to, and I say, okay, I want to take the aggressive action 10% more frequently than optimal. So I say, okay, I'm going to do it. And that would be too much pre-flop. So you do have to add some context. Um, like you couldn't, you couldn't just raise 96% on the button because you were behind because the expected value would be too punishing. 
but um, you could you could bump it from like eighty five percent to ninety percent or something. You have to use you have to use some judgment. Now, have you have you messed around with this uh, vision trainer that just came out on Phil's site? A little bit, um, not as much as I've been hoping to. Well, I would sort of doubt that you would find it useful because um, it does constrain the game tree too much for, for, for your interest. You know, like they, I would say that, uh, it's, I find it useful, but I couldn't imagine that you would. I think it's probably quite useful because it just allows you to develop mechanics by just like clicking through and playing a bunch of hands. And I wish there was an assistant whose voice popped up and explained why vision was doing what it was doing. Um, that would be that with no limit, I had, uh, some great coaching where we would do some, he would run some Munker solver, uh, problems that I'd given him. And then we would go over the solutions, but I had the, I had the benefit of him explaining why he thought the computer solution looked the way that it did. And I think that's, that's necessary in a way. Uh, well, it's certainly helpful coaching. So with the vision trainer, I find myself wishing that uh, someone could explain why the answer was the answer. Of course, everyone's explanation is gonna be flawed, but what you want in coaching is someone whose explanation is a little bit better than the explanation that you would come up with. I talk about this a lot where you're, you're trying to like constantly do like some conceptual pruning and then like develop heuristics for different situations that you can then use at the table. Um, so like, obviously the way the strategy is generated is purely mechanical. It's just an algorithm. It just plays against itself and then <clears throat> that's the output, right? It's not, no one's thinking anything, but what you want to do is look at the patterns in, in the strategy and in different, lots of different strategies and then figure out, um, identifiable mechanics. So an example of this would be again, say it's, um, ace, jack seven with a flush drawn heads up PLO and somebody checks to me. I might identify a mechanic like I want to bet most of my flop bluffs, C bet bluffs will contain bottom pair. That's a really useful mechanic because you, when you're actually at the table, you say, oh, I have this dry bottom pair hand. This should go in that bluffing range. And then you know how to play it on future streets because it, you know, it rolls over into the turn bluff and the river bluff. And so you have this solid bluffing range in the flop. And then you can choose a subset of those bluffs to continue with on different streets. Um, so those are the sorts of heuristics you can tease out of the solution. And those might be applicable on a lot of different boards. It doesn't really matter if it's H Jack seven or H Jack six, if you know the bottom pair is going to be your bluff. I found that, that the solutions have been interesting so far in that, um, do you, do you recall when like the limit bots first became a thing and lesser limit players were playing against them? It was, it was notable how stubborn they were and like just how inclined also they were to to bet so they were very very active um and with the vision trainer i notice um it's it's more active than i would have expected like it's sort of it's it's betting in spots where I might check more, like it's, it's quite active. It's, it's putting in, um, money in some spots where there seem to be good arguments for, for holding off. Um, so I, I, I look forward to, um, I look forward to going through it a good bit more. And what, one of the, one of the nice things about the way the trainer works is that you can, um, isolate certain spots and then learn about learn about earlier spots. So you could like learn about um, say uh, which hands you might four bet pre flop with by examining that that size of pot on the flop. Um, and um, I've been focused, especially because I think this is a weakness of mine on the uh, three bet flops out of position. Mm -hmm. So with that as my starting point, I'm also indirectly learning which hands the computer likes to three bet preflop with. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, uh, 
I think my learning path is basically, as you say, look at the look at the meta game of how to play the side bet strategy, how to play variance control. Um, I think Vision Trainer is good. I'm also interested in in finding like exacting heads up PLO preflop ranges for each stack size. I haven't I haven't seen a go-to resource for that in PLO. There are of course good good no limit preflop stuff, but there's I haven't seen a, a resource for like Okay, this is this is your solid preflop starting point. Um, welcome to the wide world of Munker Solver. So that's probably what you're gonna want to download. Uh, it's a it's a PLO solver. Uh, it'll do preflop for you. Um, it is kind of a crappy UI, um, so it takes some getting used to. But it but you can piece through it, and then just having the actual you know list of hands is extremely helpful. Yeah. So with no limit, I've found it beneficial to have kind of a coach that does that. So if I if I could have someone do it, I would just say show optimal preflop at 100 big blinds at 150 at 200 and then mm -hmm. it'll just print it out. The, with the with the no limit charts, they're easily readable. I, w I wonder what it looks like for uh I wonder what the PLO output looks like. Yeah, it's it's much more difficult to read. You end up kind of like um, developing a feel for it because um, there isn't just a hand ranking. Like um, PLO hands don't rank top to bottom. They have like some situational characteristics. Um, so like uh, I'll give you an entertaining example from Heads Up PLO. Um, the the computer really likes to four bet some hands like Jack 10, 5, 4, double suited at certain stack depths. Uh, and the reason is because you can hit a lot of straights with that hand, but you don't hit a lot of like really high equity, like concentrated wraps with that hand. So like paradoxically, it sort of wants to make the pot so big that anytime you catch any piece of the flop, you can just go all in afterwards, which is a hilarious and I think kind of un unexpected effect. And it's an example, you know, it's not like you're just, you're just four betting the top X percent of hands in PLO. You're, you're four betting hands that are trying to accomplish specific purposes and you're in your you're packaging together into a range that is going to benefit from from those things it, the same is true with no limit obviously you you um four bet a value region and then you have a bluffing region but in plo the there's a value region and a bluffing region but they're kind of like intertwined in this way that requires some feel to to figure out so it's about time for us to go to economics i, w I wanted to digress for a moment when we were chatting about uh bots and how bots have certain blind spots or AI, AI engine, they, they have certain uh, blind spots based on the simplifications they might have made. Um, I was thinking back to that famous uh, Durr jungle man side bet where, the, where Durr took on the limit bot in the, in the Bellagio or in the Aria and he he beat the limit bot, and I don't know whether he won out of luck or because he had found some some flaw in 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 the in the AI bot's re reasoning. Do you have any uh, or some simplification that it was making that led it astray? Do you have do you have any knowledge or insight into that one? I wish I'm missing some of the details I needed to have an informed. Um, opinion. So, I know they played a very large number of hands. I remember that part. If you know how many hands, that would be very helpful for me. I remember it could play very fast and maybe it was like 20 hours. Call it call it like 5,000 hands or 6,000 hands. Basically, it was probably variance over that sample. Um, if I plug in Tom having like a two big bet loss rate or something against the bot, um, over that many hands, Tom's still going to win about 30% of the time. So um, probably just variance. Yeah, it makes sense. I remember, I think I chatted with Tom about it briefly at the time, and he he said something about a mistake it was making on the river where it would kind of 
fold for check raises or something like that. That was that was a little a little strange, but we'll have to I'll have to save that for the Dur podcast if it ever happens. It is true that those the bot that he was playing was this one they put in casinos, and it is not as far as I know. I don't know how it was developed, but as far as I know, it's not the same class of algorithms that PyoSolver would use. Um, so it's, it's possible the bot was just bad and Tom figured out how it was bad and then crushed it. Um, I don't know any reason why that's impossible. All right. Now the tables will turn. I know. I'm excited for them to turn. Be like old times. All right. But before we go back on, I wanted to just, because I think this might interest you, is that um, you can also, you can figure out your break-even point in EV against Phil using this variance calculator. I'm guessing it's going to be like negative 4 BB in win rate or something like that. Okay. Meaning that if you think you're losing to Phil by less than or equal to like four or five big blinds per hundred, then the challenge is neutral expected value for you. Now the calculator can't take into account the quit option, which has some value, but. Are you the only one with the quit option? He has the quit option, but presumably he would never exercise it. I'm guessing neither of you. Oh, right. You can quit. So yeah, that is worth something as well. Um, and probably something fairly significant. So, so maybe it's, maybe you can be losing it um, even more than that. We, we, could, we could make a guess about what the quit option's worth if we wanted. You just kind of slice up the probability distribution to situations in which you were unlikely to get unstuck in the challenge. And, and so risking the additional money wouldn't be worth it. All right, I'm ready for econ. So for starters, take me through the podcast that you have watched. Yeah. Okay, let me get a little list here too. I'm just gonna. And by the way, podcasting it has, it has a, a funny array of costs and benefits, and I really enjoy it. I'm going to uh, definitely keep it up. But the, the the random positive response, like you telling me out of the blue that you enjoy it, is is a big part of the payoff. Um, so that's. That's probably the most important part of the payoff. Uh, secondary is you get this very unique opportunity to have long one-to-ones um, that really, like, I can't think of any other time in my life where that comes up where I can chat with someone for an hour or two and it can be just fully dedicated. Um, so that's a big part of the value. Um, I've been pleasantly surprised by how easy it is to find guests, like just cold contacting people that I think possibly might say yes, I would say has 80, 90% success rate. It's unbelievable. It's very easy to schedule guests. That's cool. Yeah. I can never predict which ones are going to be uh, popular or not popular. It's just, uh, it's a funny thing. But uh, but I enjoy it so far. I'll keep it up. Um, yeah, you have this magical thing that I think is really good in an interviewer where you'll ask me a question and I, or a series of questions. And I don't know if it's the way you ask it or your affect or some combination thereof, but I find myself saying more in a more full answer than I had previously intended, which I think is like a very good trait in an interviewer and something that's hard to... Uh, come across by accident. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. And um, I, I watched the interviews afterwards and I, I noticed like with Jim Grant at the end, he really, he really goes into a lot of depth and he does a, lo a lot of interviews and he, um, he really expounded more than he typically would. And I, and I, I, I valued that quite a lot. Yeah, I think it's having really insightful questions and also giving people space, which is something that I think you're good at. But um, thanks, man. So, what are, what are your favorites so far? So, both the Strasser podcasts I like a lot. Um, uh, I listened to the one with Nate Silver, which I liked, um, but I know a lot about him because I read. 538 in his Twitter a lot. Um, I didn't know about Ben Hunt. I thought he was a very entertaining guest and had some like pretty cool uh, takes on markets and politics and, and things like that that I really enjoyed. Um, I also, the interview with James Grant was um, 
Interesting. I mean, so when he was talk, talking about Walter uh, Bagshot, I believe is the pronunciation. Badget. Um, Badget. Okay, right. Um, Badget. Um, that was somewhat interesting. But when he really let himself loose at the end and started to talk about markets from like this very sort of academic perspective, I thought he had like really interesting takes. Um, so that was cool. Um, and then uh, the interview with uh, Maria Konnikova was really uh cool as well um because it seems like her book is like really blowing up i think it's gonna be an influential book and it was cool to hear her talk about it yeah i and i i knew that she was going to be on a lot of podcasts and i tried to i tried to ask questions that no one else would ask because i was in touch with her pr person and okay. i could see that she had much bigger interviewers than myself. So I was trying to uh, hit questions that they, they wouldn't hit. And I thought it was, I thought it was a fun interview. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So now I'm ready for, for your econ questions. Um, I, I know um, as background that you've been, somewhat systematic about studying economics, studying finance and taking what, what seems to be a very, very intelligent approach, unsurprisingly. Um, I, would, I would characterize your approach as um, sort of initially focused on market efficiency and not making any mistakes, which is a a underrated approach in in markets or in economic forecasting um if you recall in the podcast with ben hunt he said he likes to work from a regret minimization framework um where he he goes as far as to say uh he likes to make decisions on a min max regret framework, which, which means contemplate all states of the world, calculate your maximum regret in each state of the world and choose the one that has the minimal, uh, max regret, uh, which is extreme in terms of regret minimization, but in, in finance or in economics, um, the mistakes you make way way far more heavily than the good decisions that, that you make. So um, the mistakes are far more consequential than any insights that you might have, and therefore it's important to minimize mistakes. And it seems like you had an intuitive understanding of that idea. And um, then I was fascinated to hear your story about how you, you don't branch out from that way of thinking too often, but you did recently in, in, in COVID and uh, sort of took on a bet on the, on the short side of the market, or at least not being long the market and, and that, that paid off. So that was, that was pretty entertaining. Maybe you could, maybe you could take people through your approach because it's, it's definitely a time where um, for strange reasons, markets are, are uh, a source of general discussion and, and fascination. Uh, so, I mean, my, my main approach to markets is just um, matching my utility preferences with a selection of investments um, and then optimizing anything that can be losslessly optimized. So, you know, um, optimizing tax treatment and stuff. So like to fill in the blanks slightly, you know, I'm a, a young person with a high risk tolerance with a relatively healthy non-investment income. Um, and so because of that, I want to um, maximize cap gains, specifically long-term cap gains while minimizing dividends uh, in, in short-term cap gains. And then also I'm generally willing to take on relatively more volatility for more expected returns um, than most people uh, just in view of my my situation and then and then from there i just try to maximize diversification as best i can and then kind of sit there um which i think is just sort of appropriate um and then also in the, in the present interest rate environment the so on interactive brokers which is my broker you can i can borrow at about one percent annualized interest and so for me the risk reward you know if 
you buy a, a stock that hopefully has a positive expected return and pays a 6% dividend and you're borrowing at 1% to buy more of that, you know, depending on how all your wealth is allocated, that seems like a, a fairly reasonable gamble. So that's like my, my big picture thing. I, the book that had the most impact on me is um, this guy, Antti Ilmanen, wrote this book called Expected Returns. I don't know if you've heard of it. I haven't. Uh, it was recommended to me as like the mathematics of poker of, of investing, which may or may not be true, but it's like, it was very dense and I thought very informative, uh, but I, I got very into it. I have like, I have like a copy in my desk. I'm always pulling out expected returns, expected returns. <laughs> so <laughs> it's close to hand. Um, and then regarding the COVID thing, um, generally I'm a buy and hold kind of investor um, for, or I try to be, but sometimes I feel like markets are doing something so crazy that I just can't help myself. And that was the case during the COVID thing. I was learning about the COVID story just because from a personal health, protecting my family, my friends perspective, um, as we all were. And to me, it became apparent from reading the early epidemiology papers when, it, you know, they were talking about the r and in Wuhan of being, you know, between two and a half and five or six. And I'm like sitting, sitting there and I'm like, well, like <laughs> if the r not value is that high and we have a novel coronavirus and there are asymptomatic spreaders where there weren't really with like SARS and MERS and stuff. Um, and then you're looking at these little outbreaks and all the people traveling through China and out of Wuhan and stuff. Um, it, it, at that point, remember that the VIX was like 15 or something or 12 or whatever the, the hell it was in early 2020. Uh, there was like no volatility in the market and the market was at these all time highs. And to me, it seemed like a spot where betting on volatility is, and also falling prices through puts was likely to be a good gamble, even though that's obviously it's a derivative and it has uh, inclusive of fees and playing against professionals and stuff. And most times buying puts is probably going to have a pretty heavily negative expected return. And they're also super high variance. But in this particular case, I thought that the market was kind of ignoring this looming threat. And um, so I decided to bet on it. Yeah. Well, that was that was very wise. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to listen to my podcast with Ben Eifert. No, I have not. That's a good one. And he he tells the story about how implied vol came to such a to such a low price and how there there have been in the last decade, more and more systematic put writers. And so um, very unusually in, in market history, it got to a point where just sort of blindly buying at the money S&P puts in the way that you were doing it uh, was uh, at least zero EV which a zero EV on something that fully hedges an otherwise positive expectation portfolio is a good thing to do. Um, oh, yeah. and, and probably was positive expected value just on its own. And, and that situation came about because you had a large number of, of put writers and the, um, the put the universe of put, buyers had basically dried up after a very long period of the put buyers purely losing money if they were speculators or uh, just bleeding money if they were hedgers. Right. He tells some interesting stories about how um, if you think about if you think about it simplistically in that way where for at the money S P put options you have you have people writing it as part of a strategy to get yield. And historically that's been a very small number of players, but it's been, it's been bigger in recent years. Um, and then you have, you have seemingly a large number of buyers, some who are just speculator punters thinking that the market will be going down in the short term and others who are hedging a portfolio. Um, you, you had a, a unique situation around the time that you were, that you were buying these put options where the, uh, the crowd of writers of options was very large and the crowd of buyers was, was very small. There, there had been, uh, Eifert tells some, some interesting stories about how big institutional funds who had longstanding systematic 
hedging practices, like pension funds that would just buy S and P puts to to protect their portfolios. Um, they some large ones just quit doing it around the beginning of this year because they had just decided that the bleed was was uh, was too much. And of course, they quit doing it at precisely the wrong time. So, so you had the um, you had the success of predicting that markets would go down because of COVID, and then um, what about the the rebound period? How did you play that one? So, the risk profile of these puts was really good, right? Because um, so, like, you have to contextualize them with the other stuff you own. So, in my case, like, you know, I have a house, I have a portfolio of stocks that I'm long. Um, you know, I have some some small amounts of Bitcoin, things like this. But anyway, um, so obviously the risk profile of these puts was good because the, it's going to be inversely correlated with all that other stuff. So that's good. You can try and figure out how, how big you should fire also. It depends on all these probabilities. But anyway, so I did that. Um, but I didn't fire that big because puts are insane. I mean, like some of the puts I was buying, they would like go up or down 50 or 75% a day. So, I mean, and then also you have to maintain the position over time. So like if, if you go and it, say you, I want to have, you know, X thousand dollars at risk in puts, I have to have the cash behind to maintain the position after the market gyrates every day in the, in, in the position. So if the position goes up in value, I have to sell a bunch. So I'm not betting too big every day. And if the position goes down a bunch, I have to have a bunch more left in the tank so that I can continue to bet on the puts until my thesis is either proven or disproven. So anyway, for that reason, puts are really wild. You had Master uh, Strasser advising you, so it's all good. Yeah, that helps. Uh, mostly he was just telling me, don't do this. Like you're not <laughs> professional, <laughs> which is probably good advice. Anyway, um, so after a while, um, so, so I think I was plus EV during the time period when the market was basically ignoring the epidemiology, which I was not incredible at reading, but I was smart enough to actually be reading it and realize that it was likely to have an effect on, on markets. I'm not a scientist, but I could read the academic papers that were being published and, and read the summaries of them. But then in something like early March, the market realized that figuring out what the virus was going to do was going to be really important. And professional players started learning about the virus. And I realized pretty quickly, I think, that I didn't have much of an edge. And I played around with a few different other strategies. And then I sort of just realized that I didn't think I had an edge anymore. And the market just knew about as much about what the virus was likely to do as I did. And I obviously have to be pretty confident to be buying puts because you're paying a ton of big to do it. And you're playing against professionals and crap like that. And I realized, oh, the professionals know just as much as I do. So I'm, I'm, I don't know anything. So then I went long just as a default. Um, I thought, and also there was a bit of a panic. Like there were some crazy days. I don't know where like um, bond ETFs were trading like way below like net asset value because everyone was just selling things for liquidity. So there were some crazy times and there were some signs I think in the market that people were selling for pretty irrational reasons just because it had gone down so furiously that um, funds were rebalancing and things like that. And so I did think it was a good time to get into the market. Like, I mean, this is when SPY was trading at like 260 or 270 or, you know, maybe 280. Um, or even just if you're thinking about from a, you know, future cash flow model, it's like, well, yeah, sure. Coronavirus might wreck the economy, but it's not going to wreck the economy forever. So just buy and hold for those kind of three reasons seem seem better at that point. Um, I didn't think I knew anything that important anymore. The market had dropped a ton from all time highs, and there seemed to be some panic in the markets, which I think made it a better time to buy. Um, so then I did went back to my buy and hold strategy after losing a bunch of money speculating in puts when I didn't have an edge anymore. Um, but I didn't didn't completely punt at all, and then. Um, now I've been doing the buy and hold thing, but more recently I've become spooked again because I, it feels like um, the R naught value nationally is 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 rising again, and it feels like markets are slow to respond to that. Um, so I've been continuing to like look at metrics I think are important for keeping up with the epidemiology. And when anyway, so I'm I'm a little spooked at the moment. That seems logical. Um... In the big picture, it is uh, very impressive that you've had this mentality that's geared towards mistake minimization because I think it's so crucial in, in markets. Um, but it is not the thing that many of our peers are doing. If you've noticed in uh, poker and 
and daily fantasy circles. And there's among our Twitter follows, there's, there is a lot of interest in trading super actively where you're taking on the possibility of big mistakes, but also taking on the possibility of, of, of good outcomes. And, um, it's, it's bizarre that, a, a day trading phenomena has happened at this time, but it, it has happened. Do you have friends that are in that super active trading regime? And do you have any insights in, as to why it's happening now? I don't that much, um, mostly because I'm not really on social media at all. Um, but I have a few friends, like poker colleagues and stuff, but most of them are actually more conservative than me and think I'm too active and they're probably right. Or at least there's, there's something to be said for what they say. Um, because... There's a lot of people who would just like take the idea that they should just buy and hold and markets are efficient enough and they probably don't know more than the professionals and a lot of uh, markets are positive expectation over the long term and just just do that. And that, I found that that is more of the prevailing attitude than a lot of day trading in the circles that I talk to. We talked a bit a, a week ago and I was I was telling you how in my view that's the buy and hold strategy is mostly the right strategy, but the I think probably you need a, a broader diversification in in today's world because we we're probably going into a period of maximal uncertainty and maximal turbulence, and I will I will think that the next twenty years are going to be. Uh, really turbulent in every way, politically, uh, financially, in terms of stability of money and purchasing power, uh, changing like world economic order. Um, I think it just, it seems somewhat obvious that uh, <laughs> it's going to be a more volatile time. Um, I've, I've living in Miami, I've studied Latin American history a bit more and Latin American economic history. And it's in Latin American history, it's the political mishaps or failures of people to get along that typically come before the, the big economic mishaps. And you sense in the U S case that we're, we're at that moment where the politics are getting harder and when you when you have the politics start to falter it's real it's really hard to keep the the economics running smoothly and we've like in the us it's it's 330 million people it's very hard to keep 330 million people getting along right and we've always done a remarkable job of that and you can just you can just feel it now that there's tension in so many in so many different ways and so much of it is is deserved tension and problems that have been festering and um it feels like the politics are just going to be harder in the next 20 years and i don't think you i don't think a blind like buy the s p and hold does so well or you could do better people say that it's folly to time the market but I feel like undergirding that is this idea that markets must have positive expected returns forever because they have in the United States and Europe for the last like hundred plus years or something like that. Um, I don't see any law of nature why that has to continue forever. And from a very like broad perspective, like where to park your money, whether it's in uh, the stock market or commodities or real estate or whatever, um, just something that you want to hold value. Um, you have to, take some kind of view about the situation you're in and what the expected returns of the society and the different places you can park money are uh, into the future. And I think, I, I do think it's actually a mistake to just assert the stock market will continue to have expected, like positive expected returns forever and, and, and can't collapse as we see it has in other countries and other periods of history. And also the, the long run history of stock markets just isn't that long. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, well, a lot of our a lot of our assumptions about markets say no one thinks that that nominal returns are ten percent a year going forward because just 
treasuries are near zero percent and so forth. No one, no one thinks that. But for a long time, that sort of ten percent a year on stocks was a was a conventional wisdom because that had been the nineteen fifty onward history in the United States. And um, in general, so much of the way we think about markets is framed by the U.S. post war experience and. Mm-hmm. We use that time because that's the time that we have data. So like all of the finance research and and economics research, it it comes from where you have data, which is developed economies post-war. And um, what you care about as a rational person is like the quality of your decision making on a going forward basis. Like what are the what are the ex ante returns and risks for things? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's foolish to use the ex post experience of the most successful economy in history in, in what was in terms of realized outcomes, like a very successful time with not many wars and politics going fairly smoothly and, um, just a lot going right. Everything, not everything, but a lot going right. It's folly to use that 70 years, 80 years of ex post uh, to say that that's what the world will look like over the next 20 or 30 years. I also think that um, in the same way that we've, we've had political problems that have festered and they will probably reveal themselves over the next decade, for instance, like income and wealth inequality and um, um, racial problems and these things that we're talking about at this moment, they they will, we're paying the cost for them probably in the next 10 years. Uh, and in the same way that this is true on the political front, on the economic front, there are policies that we've had for a long while that have had the effect of, of ameliorating short-term problems and pushing them down the road. And it, at some point, we'll pay. Um, there's just been uh, a strong tendency to have short-term fixes at every turn. And, and I think we're, we're not so far away from the time that we, that we, that we feel the burden. Um, I, I could be totally wrong on these views. Like I've, I've had a problem of pessimism bias in the past. And it's, as you age, you, you have enough observations where you, where you learn, okay, is this bias or is this just, the realized states of the world turned out optimistic and, and, and so you're able to ask, assess your bias a little bit. And, and I hopefully am able to um, minimize the harm from, from a slight pessimism bias that I tend to have. Well, here's a question for you. Um, do you think, do you think we'll be able to grow our way out of this? Like, what do you think growth, growth rates will look at in the next five, 10, 20, 50 years, um, both domestically and globally? Because, um, I mean, one way that we can deal with some of the issues with the economy is just to have increasing growth again, right? Yeah. um, I think there's a lot of consensus among macroeconomists that the the growth rates in the next 20 years will be low. Um, Certainly, if if you look at say the um, post-war experience, obviously you're never going to match that sort of 1945 to 1975 time period, but, but 1975 to 1995 is not a particularly tough benchmark. Um, but, but we're, we're still, we're not going to come close to that. We're, we're um, I think there's just been continuous declines in in growth rates um and so why is there consensus that that growth will be low over the next 20 years 
Um, there's one very obvious thing that weighs strongly, which is the labor force is going down because of aging populations. That's the single biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, because the baby boom generation was, was so large and they're going into retirement, the labor force participation rate as a whole will be going down and your labor force is basically shrinking and it's hard to grow at high rates when that's happening. So that's, that's like number one. And number two is the, um, the near 0% interest rates across the economy are telling you something about how profitable it is to uh, invest in new capital. Like, like if you look at times where real economic growth was very high, they tended to correspond to both high interest rates and high rates of investment because like there were just so many obvious things you could do where you could invest money in, in new capital and that capital would like pay itself off very quickly. And it would be a, a, a super profitable, super good investment to build a new uh, car plan or, or what have you. Um, the near 0% interest rates today say something about the dearth of profitable investment opportunities that also tends to be associated with lower growth going forward. Um, the obvious unknown is extreme technological innovations. And that's something that like macro ec economists can't say too much about. Um, and so we will always have that just unknown that over the next 20 years, you'll have uh, technology that could have some extreme accelerations and that could, that could lead to crazy productivity growth and crazy growth. Um, but I think Wayne, Wayne bigger, uh, practical side is the politics. That's what I kind of worry about. Um, you just, let's just say looking at Latin America now, it's a fairly bad picture all around and most of it can be traced to politics. And it's not clear to me uh, how much different the US situation going forward looks where the polarization and levels of inequality, it, it looks, looks very Latin American at the moment. And um, I'm it not sure. Very Latin American. Yeah, I'm not sure the policy responses will be so much better. Um, so yeah, I, I think like in the next 20 years, we can no longer make this assumption that, that 330 million Americans get along well and we can just run the economy according to economic principles yeah. and it'll take care of itself. Talking a little bit more about the connection between economics and um, market valuations. Like I, you know, I'll click through ETFs of, of different regions. And one of the ones that I looked at is this um, EWZ, which is the iShares Brazil index. You know, this is just a random one. It could be anything in Latin America. But you look at the what these um, developing country stock market valuations are, and the things trade at like two point. I mean, this one's trading at two point three XPE. And then you look at what U.S. markets trade at. And do you think these very different PE ratios for for national indexes are? in large part traceable to different political regimes? Um, I think those situations are so particular that you really have to get granular with exactly what is the vehicle and exactly what do they hold? If you can find out like their, their holdings list or what are they likely to hold and um, it varies so much by situation. It's, it's really hard to, to say things. So like there are certain things that might be happening that could explain it quickly that we just don't know without knowing the particulars. Like for, for, for instance, um, you have to look at things like, are the, um, are the 
positions hedged or unhedged currency currency wise uh is there are there any sort of uh like capital controls or are there any are there any um are there any reasons that just straightforwardly suggest themselves as reasons for the the low valuation or um then with brazil are there any uh risk to foreign holders are there any um current restrictions about uh i don't know what these companies can do in terms of paying dividends or getting money back to shareholders uh, there's so much about a situation that can be particular that that i don't know in that case and in general it can be hard to know um so so yeah i would say that it's just too hard to say without digging into the particulars and is it is it purporting to track the the index or is it like a it's not a closed in fund right it's a no it's it's it's, it's tracking an index and the the index is some um mostly large cap selection of of brazilian companies you'd have to you'd have to dig in and 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 find out i mean it could it could be just the straightforward explanation that um Brazil's outlook is thought to be quite terrible. Um, yeah. So it could just be that earnings are going to fall off a cliff quite predictably. Yeah. Also, it, it appears that it depends where you look, how they calculate the PE ratio, which speaks to your point about context and stuff mattering too. So uh, in the worst case, I mean, Brazil could look like Venezuela in uh, a decade or something in the worst worst possible case. Um, but the Venezuelan stock market is interesting because you had the disconnect between the stock market and the economy where in, in nominal terms, the stock market was going up just because expected inflation was, and actual inflation was pushing up stock prices. Um, right. Has some relevance for the current US situation where there is, it is hard to interpret the, the fact that stock prices are almost un, unchanged on the year when obviously the economy suffered a lot of damage. Um, is that explained by the fact that the Fed put, which we always knew existed, is much more powerful than, than we had previously thought? Like, People are now more confident than ever in strong Federal Reserve intervention. Um, is it due to the fact that the market is rationally just Xing this year off the spreadsheets, but with 0% interest rates, it doesn't make much of a difference as long as you recover by 2022 or 2023? Or, or is it that the market is sniffing out uh, inflation and then just answering the question, all right, what's the world look like in five or 10 years? And let's value things according to that now. And, and that's producing the current valuation structure. It's, it's really hard to say what's going on. Um, and I, I, I think that the um, Robin Hood narrative is probably overblown. The idea that like these stocks that we see going crazy are just uh, people on their apps clicking away. Uh, there is some definite explanatory power there. Like there are some data slices that make it very clear that that it is at play, the Robin Hood punter. Um, but I think there are, there are other things going on as well. For instance, there is a strong tendency for markets to move in the direction of maximum pain. And we it seems strange that after the sharp decline in in march the direction of of max pain could still be markets flying straight up with like growth companies very speculative companies far outperforming value companies but that i think that was like a max pain trade and now um we're 
we're just proceeding very far along those lines of the max maximum pain trade. Um, and I also, I also think that markets just naturally behave in a funny way when interest rates get near zero and you're discounting very, very long futures. Um, you can see a lot of that in the way the market behaves today where it just, it really does try to look at what the world might be like in a decade and price things accordingly. And we have an interest in, in the gaming space. It's been crazy what DraftKings has done, their stock price, their valuation hit 15 billion or something. Um, and I haven't looked at their statements recently, but they've lost a lot of money over their, over their lifetime. But the market just sort of looks at, looks at things and says, what, what's the world look like in five or 10 years? And they see DraftKings will be in a great position then. And they just, they, they value it, uh, accordingly today and excuse current and past losses. Yeah. So I have a, I have a question just about interest rates too. So this, for me, just from just from the perspective of an investor, these close to zero percent interest rates are in these interest rates that are much lower than inflation. Just really boggle my mind. Um, why would anyone buy bonds right now? So it's, it's, it's complicated. It's evolved a lot over the past decade. Um, the eight years ago, the answer would have been, um, well, let's, let's just go back to exactly 2009. Okay. In 2009, the projected deficit was 1.9 trillion. Obama put out his his first budget and was going to be very aggressive in combating the oncoming recession. Um, it turned out the realized deficits were a good bit lower than 1.9 trillion, but that was the projected call the realized like 1.45. Um, so the treasury borrowing in that year has to be the rollover of the debt, uh, the normal roll, rolling of the debt plus that that 1.45 trillion in that spending exceeds taxes. Um, so in a year like that, um, say, 600 billion of the of the 1.45 trillion would be our trading partners that ran surpluses against us and chose to take uh treasuries in return so at that time maybe china would be running a surplus of 300 billion and they would take they would put a lot of it in in treasuries politically we wouldn't let them buy ports and we wouldn't let them buy important California real estate. They might have wanted to do that with the money instead, but as just the way it evolved politically and economically, they recycled a lot of it into treasuries. Um, so they would be a big buyer. There would also be um, financial institutions that were required by regulators to have a risk-free part of their portfolio that that might be buyers of treasury, even though there were other better risk reward opportunities available to them. Um, and then to the extent that those parties weren't taking up the full 1.45 trillion, you had quantitative easing by the Fed, which this, the stated purpose was to stimulate the economy, but the actual purpose might well have been just to keep funding of the government at the desired level, mm -hmm. right? So, so then um, as you got 
deeper into the financial crisis and into a bit of a recovery, um, the deficits remain stubborn. We, we continue to run high deficits even as the economy recovered. Um, and in, say, 2010, 2011, 2012, China was still an important part of the, the treasury buying because they were, we were running big deficits against China and they, they tended to buy treasuries. Um, but the interest rate was getting lower and lower and, um, increasingly the, the buyer was the federal reserve through QE2 and QE3 and QE4. And then we sort of got trapped in that pattern and we found ourselves where we are now, where interest rates are near zero and, there are few natural buyers of treasuries and some of the trading partners that historically took treasuries without asking much no longer want to do so. And basically the only way we can fund the government is to have the uh, Federal Reserve buy all of the bonds that the treasury needs to issue at the desired interest rates, which are near zero. And that's that's just the that's just unfortunately where we are, and it creates a bizarro uh, economic and financial world. Um, and I don't see anything to change that in the in the near term. Do you think inflation will rise? Because the story you've told makes it seem like it should. Yes, I do. Um, there are interesting counter arguments, but. Um, I do think inflation rises over the over the medium to long term. Um, an important part of the story is that the the zero interest rates are not natural interest rates. They're simply what the government needs them to be to maintain the narrative they 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 need the interest rates to be low and they will do what it takes to keep the interest rates low in other words like because we've been running high deficits for a long time and our accumulated debt is very high um and our future deficits are projected to be very high like almost 4 trillion this year the if you plug in interest rates of say 4% or 5% or 6%, your spreadsheet just like blows up in red. Mm -hmm. Like your interest rates as a percent of the federal budget each year, your, your interest costs as a percent of the federal budget each year start to blow up to like mid double digits and it gets, it gets insane. And like just everything just blows up red. The interest rates, which Jim Grant would call the most important price in the economy. Um, they no longer operate in anything close to a free market. They're the policymakers, the Fed forces them near zero because they have to be near zero to make the government's borrowing picture look sustainable. And so um, a lot of, seeming absurdities about the current economy and the current financial markets stem from the fact that that the government forces the interest rate on government bonds um, to near zero levels regardless of the of the duration of the borrowing and lending and so it does create interesting opportunities as a as a, say a, a speculator or as an individual there there are, um, you can through uh, tips, through inflation protected treasuries and, and through uh, various, um, various bets on tips, you, you can make a, a bet on future rates of CPI. And because the yield curve is just almost at zero 30 years down the line, the um, 
you're able to take take a bet that say uh, inflation years ten through fifteen are going to be high, and you get you get that bet at a very at a very good price because the implied That's inflation. A great bet. Yeah, I think I think so, and it's one of those bets that like almost no one is making. Um, and there there are other straightforward ways to make the same bet. You could just like have a lot of gold or something like that. Um, right. But yeah, um, I don't see I don't see an exit from this environment of just yield curve control by by the central authorities and uh going back to politics one thing that i've noticed as an investor like you know a relatively wealthy investor compared to the standards of ordinary americans right now for sure uh in this environment is that if you're so i mean i talked to like you know my dad who's a retiree and he feels like he has to buy bonds because he doesn't want to take on the variance he's not he's living on a fixed income and this seems like it's true for a lot of americans who don't have a lot of accumulated wealth and small changes in their wealth can be really destructive to their lifestyle. And so they're willing to give up large amounts of expected returns to, re to reduce their variance, which makes them buy things like these bonds that have like negative real yields and stuff. Um, do you think that the government pushing down these bond yields while kind of bailing out markets and, and reducing uh, having really low tax rates and long-term cap gains and stuff um, and allowing people who are able to take on some risk to generally have much, much higher real returns in the bond market. Uh, do you think this is increasing income inequality? Yes. Um, I, I definitely think so. And um I think there are there are policymakers that would like to move to a negative interest rate regime um, for some of the reasons that you mentioned. Um, the negative interest rate regime it it does quite effectively pull demand into the present because your money is losing value over time. I mean, it already is though in real terms. Yeah, not everyone believes that, but I, I believe that. Um, so you use your dad as an example. And basically what happens in a, in a highly inflationary environment, like in an unstable Latin American country is everyone spends way too much time thinking about their finances and like thinking about their plans. And in the U S in a healthy financial market, people, people who wanted to spend a lot of time thinking about it would spend a lot of time thinking about it, but it wouldn't be a day to day tough trade-offs. Um, Whereas in a hyper, not a hyperinflationary, but in, a, in an economy with high rates of inflation, you have all these terrible options. Your, your money is declining in value every day. So on the one hand, it would seem like you should just spend it now and buy uh, assets that you might want now, like buy a car that you hold on to, buy, buy the house that you hold on to. Um, on the other hand, if you want to make money last as a retiree, you have to just accept the fact that you can't you can't take on any risk. Uh, fluctuations are always going to be higher in this sort of inflationary environment. You can't take on those fluctuations, and you just have to to eat your negative return and know that you're going to be one of the big losers in the inflationary economy. Um, and then. Um, if we think of those two strategies as uh, accept the fact that as a saver, you're going to be a big loser in the inflationary economy and just play it super safe anyway, or um, knowing that your money's losing value in the future, just spend it now on things that you want and deal with, deal with the future later. And um, 
Another possibility, which seems seems to be a choice that a lot of people make now, is they uh, they say, well, since the bank's offering me a zero percent interest rate, or the treasury's offering me a zero percent interest rate, and I can't live on my savings that way, then I'm just going to have to to chase the eight or ten percent return and hope it works out. Um, and that's another strategy. Um, so yeah, it's like all, all bad choices with, with negative interest rates, it at least makes, makes it explicit that consuming today has value relative to waiting. You have all of the practical difficulties of implementing it. Like you could just have cash and, um, not be affected by the negative interest rate. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would anticipate that negative interest rates will be an ongoing part of the policy discussion. Yeah. Do you, do you have any opinion on like, so I like, while we're talking, I pull up my U S like debt to GDP ratio chart. I don't look at macroeconomics that much. I'm mostly from a more invest. I mean, I do, but not necessarily things like this. Um, do you, or does the do economist kind of have an idea of what levels of debt GDP ratio were sustainable for a modern economy like the United States? This time is different. The Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt book that came out around 2012 or so, that is the most complete data source. What it suggests is that when you get over 90% debt to GDP, it's it starts to tax growth quite a lot. It can be it's very hard to grow with uh, debt to GDP over ninety percent, and so it when you're not growing, the the problem becomes a vicious cycle type problem. Um, part of the reason you're not growing is because so much uh, is going towards ongoing debt service, and um, if you're above a hundred percent and you're and you're not growing, then each year you're just sort of adding adding to the debt, which is in turn increasing the interest costs as a percent of the budget, which is in turn increasing deficits and increasing debt. And you get in that that vicious vicious cycle. Um, you have you have Japan as a as an interesting case of being able to uh, have okay economic outcomes despite stratospheric uh, debt to GDP. Um, the U.S. seemingly has gone from 60% to 100% without too much of an issue. You also, you also have, like, in the U.S. case with the aging population and built-in entitlement expenses for things like Medicare and Social Security, um, you have the debt. You also have unfunded future liabilities for Social Security and Medicare. Um, some people think those are like 40, 50 trillion. So there are those people would argue that the debt to GDP for the U.S. has been several hundred percent for uh, for a while with seemingly <clears throat> limited adverse consequences. So. Um, I'm, I think that, yeah, high debt to GDP, it, it is a problem, uh, for the U S the reason that we've been able to do it for so long is because we are the international currency, the most desired place to park assets. The U S dollar is the world currency. And, um, I think we will, we will push that to absolutely absurd levels and then it will break. So I so I think that we will push things like year to year budget deficits debt as a percent of GDP <laughs> um we will we will push the privilege of the US dollar to an insane degree before it breaks and I I do think it breaks. I also think that 
in terms of pure economics, take take political arguments out of it, um, we have a, a bit of room until it breaks. I could see it. I could see us muddling through for five, ten years before you, you get that that break. Um, but it could also happen. It could also happen next year. Who knows? When you say it breaks, what does that mean at a more granular level? I think what it means in the in the U.S. standpoint is um, there are two events in the past twelve months that have brought like global supply chains into the discussion. One is COVID, and the other is the trade war with China. Right. Um, so certain things that are under the radar, like China producing a lot of our pharmaceuticals and producing a lot of everyday essentials like paper towels and things like this, like um, they're under they're under the radar, but then things like COVID expose, okay, if they stop now, uh, where does that leave us? And there was also a bit of this discussion in the during the during the trade war, which didn't amount to much. Um, but in terms of where it leaves us, I think the issue is that the US economy as an overall is so focused on tertiary and and um, sort of extreme specialized activities. There's so much privilege mm -hmm. that if you had, let's, let's just suppose, um, well, let's just use a random example that's just like, like out there, but illustrates the point. Let's suppose that a year down the road, uh, Trump is still president. The social media environment has just become worse and worse. And um, conflict is as strong as it's ever been. And you have one night where instead of uh, many riots, you have like a maximal riot and, and the next day, this could never happen, but we're just using an, an illustrative example. The next day, the US dollar falls by 40%. Could never happen. But what's interesting about the example is there are not necessarily strong market forces that make the US dollar recover to old levels having fallen 40%. Um, and arguably, if the U.S. dollar falls, there there are a lot of vicious cycles that come into play that could make it fall further still. So, for instance, we're still needing the same absolute quantity of paper towels, of of iPhone parts, of all these things that we import, and needing the same absolute quantity, but having to pay more for them because the dollar has fallen will uh, cause our current account deficit to increase, which tends to be associated with the dollar falling more still. Um, there are, by the nature of our position, I think a lot of vicious cycles that can kick in once things start going uh, down. And that's what makes it risky to test the international love for the dollar. Right. And we are testing it by doing things like running $4 trillion deficits, by doing things like having the Federal Reserve buy junk bond ETFs. Like we are doing a little bit to test it day by day. And so my contention is that you get away with that for a year, for three years, but some sometime in the next decade, we test it a little bit too much and we pay we pay the cost. As an investor, again, to protect yourself from some of these possible futures that seem at least causally coherent, we might not know their probability, but like switching back to the to the minimax framework where we're trying to avoid futures that we think are at least fairly probable that result in lots of pain. Um, what sorts of changes to a typical portfolio, a typical portfolio or, or you know, variable amounts of stocks and bonds by your age and financial situation and risk tolerance um, 
what sorts of changes in canonical portfolio construction would you recommend? International diversification is a smart thing, especially if you have direct control. There are uh, complexities with Americans taking ownership of foreign assets, but uh, just the idea, I don't know your situation being in, in Canada a lot of the time, but um, there's a reason that London property prices have gone up in the way they have because there's something attractive about having the having the key to uh, to to a place in with with stable politics and stable economics, relatively stable economics. So, um, international diversification that's not just diversification on paper, but possibly. Uh, you have some connection, whether it's you've invested in your friend's business or you trust who's located somewhere else or something like that. That's, uh, that seems, that seems good. Uh, I think, I think I'm in favor of, um, gold, which has had a very valuable role in turbulent times. I think is it's smart to have an extreme position like 20, 30%. I think that, I think that's wise. I've been, I've been reading a book called, uh, extreme economies about really just off the map economic situations like say Syrian refugee camps, how, how economies evolve in a Syrian refugee camp or how economies evolved in Indonesia after the, uh, the tsunami. And it's pretty fascinating. Like in the, the first chapters on Indonesia and they say that historically people had basically saved in the way that the 2005 poker player would like a 2005 poker player if they had the big score they'd buy the nice rolex or whatever right which seems flashy and stupid but there there's also a logic that if you have a if you have a down tick you you run it to the pawn shop or to a friend or a dealer or whatever, and you have at least some emergency access to cash. Um, Indonesians in the part of Indonesia that that is explored, they would do this as longstanding historical practice. Like they would, they would have jewelry that they would wear. They would also families would have gold and and um, the groom would often give some uh, gold to the the bride's family at marriage and it, like gold was a, a important part of the uh the culture and jewelry the book notes that it served it served the economy during the crisis of the tsunami because if you compare it to the western fragility where when something terrible happens like that, uh, our banking sector, which is the most efficient banking sector in the world in a lot of ways, it also has some fragility. So mm -hmm. like you have that extreme loss if say Miami is taken out by a hurricane or San Francisco is taken out by an earthquake and the, the capital loss in the banking sector is another problem to be dealt with. Whereas in Indonesia, um, like literally everything's wiped out. Like all the houses, all the, all, along some beach towns, like everything is gone, including a lot of the people. So basically all you have left is some people have managed to escape the tsunami on, on motorbikes and gone up into the hills or whatever. And, um, then the only thing they've taken in a lot of, a lot of times is their their motorbike and their jewelry and their gold and um and then they as part of the recovery sell everything that they own that they can get cash for and use that cash to buy things that they need but that jewelry or that gold has served themselves very well because now they're able to just sell it at the international price and and they um 
they weather the storm. So it's like an investment, but also like an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. I think that that has some some relevance. Just taking taking um, refuge in the fact that for five thousand years it's held up purchasing power, so probably continues to hold up purchasing power. Probably does at least as well as the inflation rate. Um, so that seems smart. It seems not, it seems like a good idea to uh, have a nice house invest money that way and like things that you need that you value spend now um, so those are that's simple advice but that's that's what i have that all sounds fairly dire i have to say like the the worldview you have to have to offer that advice i feel like it's pretty pretty pessimistic brandon your opportunity cost for having a very safe portfolio, a very diversified and very safe portfolio, or let's say your opportunity cost for say, having 25% in gold or something. Mm -hmm. Your opportunity cost for that is lower than it's ever been. That's true. Because bonds offer interest of near zero and um, stocks rationally price off those near zero bonds and and they price for very low single digit returns with high fluctuations. Um, so the so the opportunity cost of something really safe is is pretty low. Do you think that um, residential real estate? This is my particular case. Um, I live in Toronto, which is a big city and has a particularly frothy real estate market. So the you can think of a real estate, or at least I like to think of, a, of real estate as like partly commodities. I mean, my I live in an old house that's built of bricks and shit. You know, those are like commodities. But then also it's the sort of the speculative value of a relatively small piece of land in a desirable city. Do you feel like real estate like that works less like a commodity than like, you know, a log cabin in the woods or something like that, where the, the value of the land is likely to fluctuate less? I don't think it works much like a commodity. I think basically almost all of the increase in price comes from the increase in land and the commodity part of your house, like the actual structure, um, that does depreciate like in, in real terms, it's like depreciating. So, yeah. so you're, so I think you're, um, you're basically just along the land, which does, historically speaking for capital cities go up at a rate greater than the inflation rate, which is gotcha. like a good thing. And it, but it, in theory, in terms of the, the structure itself, if you, um, if you're evaluating a real estate market, then you, you really would have to know the cost of replacing space. Um, so for instance, I live in Miami, right? Miami historically has not been a good place to own real estate necessarily, even though the population growth rate is really high. Um, and that's because when, when you have population growth, the best situation is like a San Francisco where because of geographical constraints, water, a lot of water and uh, political constraints where they just don't want building. Most of the population growth shows itself as increased prices and there's not nearly as much building as there could be. So it shows up a little bit in increased supply and a lot in increased prices. Whereas in Miami, Increased demand shows itself mostly in increased supply and a little bit in increased prices. Um, but if you were evaluating any particular real estate market, you would want to know um, at that exact point in time, how much is likely to translate into 
how much is demand likely to translate into increased prices versus increased supply? So for instance, I don't know the situation in Miami, but let's suppose the situation were one where um, the cost to put up square footage relative to the prevailing value was quite low. Then that would be one where almost definitely any increase in, in demand shows up as increased supply, more buildings going up and not, not um, prices going up. Whereas what you would want is a situation where um, because of inflating material costs or tight labor or something like that, the cost of putting up a building is uh, getting to be in line with values. And, and so um, it's, it's likely that the uh, increase in demand shows itself up and just prices being bid up rather than a lot of new buildings going up, yeah, which is sense. marginally profitable. Um, but anyway, I think real estate also is a consumption asset and in, in inflationary right. times, that would seem to be a wise thing to, uh, to invest in. I just want to end it with like a more topical, like COVID related question. So there seems to be like some tension between the so-called markets predicting like a more V-shaped recovery or the real estate, or so the retail investor predicting a more V-shaped recovery as compared to what economists and policymakers think is likely to be um, a much slower recovery. Um, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think the catalyst will be for things happening? I think we're at a time of maximal uncertainty. I, this won't be an answer to your question, but I think, I think we're at a time where, first of all, in terms of what economists and policymakers think, now is a time where you can trust what they say less, less than ever before. Like in other words, um, a lot of policymakers, they're constrained by by what they they can say because they need they need certain conditions. Uh, they can't undermine certain conditions. So so they're I, I feel like what people say is less than what, what people what people say is less than ever before. Like what they mean, um, academic economists. Yeah, there are there are going to be some uh economists that you can that you can trust when you say retail is predicting v-shaped i would say it's fair to say that you can make the broader statement that the that the financial markets could see, are pricing in uh v-shaped um i would say when i look at say the financial markets um i say very unclear whether they're right or wrong. Uh, very unclear what they're saying. Very unclear whether how they're reacting day to day or month to month has very much at all to do with COVID. Um, in the in the immediate, like the near term, I would say. Um, it's it's just not clear to me whether markets are primarily concerned and primarily pricing fiscal response and monetary response and or if they're looking at the likelihood of a, a v-shaped recovery i think um i think it's just very unclear what the market is saying or what the market is is pricing day to day. I think the market is has always been complicated and it's always been hard to say why the markets move the way they, they move. And I think we're at a time where it's harder than ever before to interpret uh, a price change. Whether you're talking about a day, a week, a month. Of course, it's always easy to say, all right, the market declined today because COVID news or whatever, but a more sophisticated person would have would have seen coming what you viewed as news, what you view as the, the, the headline news like a few days ago or a week ago. It, to me, it's 
it's at a, it, we're at a time where it's very, very hard to interpret um, short-term moves. It's also very hard to say why there seems to be a disconnect with financial markets, which are relatively buoyant, and the economy, which is in terrible shape and doesn't seem to have a great outlook. Um, it's, it, in my mind, it will remain unclear whether it's because market is sniffing out future inflation and and a very aggressive Federal Reserve, or if the market is correctly assessing that two years from now the economy will be back on the, a, a healthy growth path and at zero percent interest rates we can we can discount a bad 2020 and 2021. Yeah, it looks like it'll be exciting times. So when you're gambling, it's like, uh, it's a particular view. It's, I think you did it in an extremely intelligent way in February where you, you had that, the, the COVID outlook and you saw the pricing, the pricing disconnect. Um, going forward, I think it's very, very hard to make bets of that type where it's like, I, I think COVID's going to be worse than, than generally expected. So I'll short the market. I think it's so much harder now than it was before because it just wasn't priced in at all. But I mean, like, if you, I don't know if you've looked at the numbers, but like one of my go to metrics is I just go to like RT Live. It's just a, a day, it's a site that's updated daily with estimates for the R naught value uh, per state. And you can kind of look at rates of change in that. Anyway, it's just like you look at some of these values and you look at what doubling times they imply. And it's just like, to me, it just sometimes feels like, well, either we're going to relax restrictions such that economies can reopen and we'll get some, some earnings and we'll you know, increase spending and, and get the economy back on track. But if we do that, it doesn't seem like it's going to be possible in the United States to keep the r not value nationally uh, below like 1.2 and if the r naught is like 1.2 nationally like the doubling time for cases is like i don't know what it is like approximately 20 or 30 days or something like that so you're just but the the long story short is that it doesn't seem like it's possible to both reopen and keep virus numbers under control even during high summer which are the most favorable conditions for doing so and so for me it feels like the market is not pricing this in appropriately still that it may be the case that, that that reopening is going to be very difficult i have like very low confidence in this forecast you you could have higher confidence if we had a um a good knowledge of how many people have had covid which that seems to be the important thing that we don't know Right. Well, we, we have a little bit of an idea. So we don't know. I haven't looked at the most recent data on this, but I looked as of a few weeks ago because it was a question I was interested in as well. When you look at even with the variation in false positive and false negative rates in the, in the antibody tests, which is a big issue, it seems like you know, not more than 10% of people in the heavily affected city centers have had it and nationally less than that. So it doesn't appear that a high enough proportion of the society has had it that the R naught values will be decreased significantly. Although maybe, but maybe they will be by this winter. I don't know. I mean, if people keep getting at this rate, I mean, it, it's going to happen eventually. Yeah, that makes sense. That estimate seems, seems reasonable. Well, I have no idea how long we've gone, but it's definitely been my longest podcast. It's been a lot of fun. I hope, hope there's a round two at some point in our future, maybe like a week before the, uh, the Galfon match, anything that comes up, you, you know, you can always just call me. We can just, you can just call me like, I've got nothing going on. Let's start a podcast. I'll, I'll just, I'll say, give me 10 minutes, fire up the camera, fire up, uh, fire up zoom and we'll go. Okay. Well, I'll issue the same invitation to you. Give me a call. Okay. We're on. All right. Nice talking to you, Brandon. I'll see you. Be good.